Hello, Internet. Uh, a little while ago, I made a video about Play Play Mini. Um, you don't have to watch that video. I will summarize Play Play Mini. It is a C-sharp framework that, uh, for making games that runs on top of Monogame. It's something I've been making, I don't know, on and off for like 10-ish years, very informally at first. It was code I was copy-pasting. And initially, uh, those concepts were implemented in Java. And then I got onto C-sharp and liked that a lot more. And then I learned Monogame. And so eventually, really like a couple years ago, I really firmed it up, made a NuGet package, and made a bunch of documentation so that anyone can make a game with it. Uh, and I think my documentation is pretty good. Uh, if anything, it might be a little too wordy rather than having too little information. Um, but something that really is missing, I think, I don't know, trying to make a game or anything just by reading documentation is kind of difficult. Um, and so what I decided to do was make a demo game. Um, it's a breakout clone. It uses mono game it uses, because it uses Play Play Mini, uh, but it also uses some other libraries that in no way are required, but you might want to solve some common problems. So how do you score a high score table and settings? And maybe like if you want to offer save game, uh, you can deal with like the binary serializers or whatever that are built in. Uh, there's problems with those. Yeah, well, that's a topic for another time. Um, I have recently really enjoyed using SQLite and Entity Framework. Um, I have a very strong web background. That's where I do most of my stuff, like for work. Um, so Entity Framework, I'm using that all the time, every day. And I love it. It's super, it's super good. <laughs> um, I mean, Dapper is also very good. You could use Dapper if you wanted, no problem. Some kind of ORM. Um, and SQLite. SQLite is, uh, you know, you, you don't want your whoever downloaded your game to have to install a database server like install Microsoft SQL or MySQL, that'd be bananas. Um, SQLite, you can avoid all that. It just dumps a file on your disk somewhere, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and then Serilog for logging errors to a text file. Why not? That's another thing you might want to do. Um, this little caveat I will summarize, although I say that and it'll probably take longer than it would take you to read. Um, yeah, I made this game pretty quick just the better part of a day and like this evening. Um, the physics are pretty roughly implemented. There's definitely bugs. I'll show you one of them. It's pretty easy to reproduce. Uh, the code is a little nasty. I'll show you that too. I wasn't worried too much about that though because the point of this project is not to demonstrate physics code. You could use Block 2D, get a C-sharp um, implementation of Block 2D. That would be a much better choice. Uh, certainly for a breakout clone, that would probably be great. Um, but I'm right. The goal of this project is to demonstrate how to use Play Play Mini. So the you know it could have been a Tetris thing. It could have been I don't know Pac Man, whatever. I just wanted a simple arcade game, and Breakout is pretty simple, simpler than Pac Man, I would say. Um, so anyway, that's it. Let me show you the game um, and some of the stuff I was talking about with the database. So yeah, I'll start. Well, let's start with a startup. So um, this file is a pretty typical for Play Play Mini. Um, entry point for your project. You set the window size, what's your initial game state, window title, all these things. Load all your assets, great. Um, this is a little different. So this is for setting up Sarah Log. Uh, I also just wanted to show, you know, maybe for your debug build, you want to write to console as well as disk, and also you want to see more info, so I show how you might set up that. Um, this keeps your log file for a day. That's a handy feature of Sarah Log. Whatever. That's all standard Serilog stuff. You can look that up. But here's how you would configure it within Play Play Mini um, in the services thing. For other services like the database, um, Play Play Mini offers this auto register attribute that you can attach to your things and it will just register them up um, with, with the IOC container. So here's a database. Um, here's how you use SQLite and tell it where to put your file. So this file system helpers thing, I just pulled out a little bit of logic. There's reasons for this. I don't know. This video will go on forever if I go into all the reasons for everything. Um, I don't know. You can ask questions. Maybe I'll, I'll I'd be happy to answer. Um, but anyway, this puts things in your app data folder, which I can show you. That's just here. No, it's not. <laughs> That's a different folder. Uh, here it is, app data. So. In Windows, this in this environment get folder path, this is a built-in .NET thing. Um, it works for Windows and it also works for Linux, which by the way, block, block break will build on Linux and so will anything that uses Play Play Mini. Um, Play Play Mini won't build for 
Android and, and Mac. It only does Windows and Linux, and that's because Monogame makes it very hard to do cross-platform. They've architected Monogame, I would say, poorly. <laughs> it is not easy to make a cross-platform uh, project, not nearly as easy as it should be. And so for Play Play Mini, I just haven't bothered. Um, you can make a pull request on Play Play Mini if you'd like to improve that. Um, but anyway, by using these built-in features, make sure to use directory separator char so that you're not Windows or Linux specific, we can indicate a path to put this database, data.db, because it's called, uh, here it is, data.db. Fine. And that's all. If you've done um, SQLite before, that's probably pretty familiar. Uh, I don't know how common that is. Maybe no one uses SQLite. I don't know. Uh, on model creating. So this is one way you might populate some data in your database. And let me show you what this looks like in the game, because we're looking at like crazy code, and you can probably guess what's going on here, but I'll show you. Oh, game is starting up. Uh, there is a loading screen. Unfortunately, this, it always starts up on the other monitor, because that's my primary monitor. This is my secondary monitor. I just don't want you guys to see all the crazy stuff I got open, and also my horrible mess of a desktop. It's just embarrassing. So we're going to share the screen instead. The startup screen that you missed, though, it does take about a second, I would say, and that's because of Entity Framework. Uh, Entity Framework, the uh, when you start it up and when you first get any data, that takes a little bit of time, some, some noticeable amount of microseconds, um, or milliseconds, rather, is what I meant to say. Uh, but it's, it's fast after that, so that's good. Uh, if you noticed a slight delay there, that is like a slight delay of hitting that, that database table. I have things to say about that, but I'll get there later. So anyway, this is the high score table. It only saves 10 scores. Um, and if you run this game fresh, you're going to have these high scores. And the way that that is accomplished is by uh, using has data. If you've used Entity Framework, you've probably seen this before. If you haven't, again, it's a Microsoft product, super standard, super popular, especially in the web world, and very well documented. So you can find, you know, if you were to ask the internet or probably even all the fun new chat AIs, how do I, you know, seed some data in my database? You're going to get this answer. You use has, has data. That's one way. Another way that I wanted to, um, again, in, in the spirit of showing multiple ways of doing things, if we look at the startup game state, and this is where, um, if you recall, in the program we said, what is the initial game state? It's the startup state. So that's where execution is going to go first. And here, and I do a fun little thing, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, but we migrate the database, so it's a code-first database. Again, if you know Entity Framework, that's very familiar. If not, that's a thing you can Google. Um, and this is one of the reasons I prefer databases over using something like the binary serializer or XML serializer, because you can migrate someone's data with any new changes. So you know, if, if you were publishing this on Steam, like I did with Word by Word, every time I publish a Word by Word update, if there are database changes, no one has to lose anything. You can write a migration to, to move people's data, add the columns to their database or whatever. Very good, very useful. Um, but here's the other way that you might seed some initial data. Um, check if the table is empty, and if it is, add it and save. I thought this was better to do with settings than the high score table, because if the high score table is empty, like you might argue, you know what, if the high score table is empty, whoops, what's going on there? Right, if, if there's nothing in here, uh, you could say not any, that's another way to do it. Uh, if there's nothing in here, I want to create the high score tables, populate them. You could do that. Um, if someone, I don't know, why would that happen? Someone hacked their, their database, fine. The settings, though, are important because other parts of the game are going to look at the settings and use those to like set the zoom level, which I'll show that working in the settings. Um, right, we're assuming a lot of the code assumes that row exists. And so on startup, I'm going to say if it doesn't exist, let's put it there because the rest of the game is just going to assume. So if you do hack the database mid-application run, you'll probably crash the application. And I'm OK with that, because you shouldn't be messing with the database, <laughs> especially while the game is running. So anyway, that's another way you might persist data. And I'll show you what this is saving, this setting. So the zoom level is just um, how many pixels per chunky pixel. So uh, again, it doesn't want to open on the right thing. So if I go into settings, and this is going to make it reset. But here's two times zoom. Let's go to four times zoom, right, whatever no zoom, that's going to be each pixel is literally one pixel, um, which is a harder way to play the game. Uh, so anyway, here is the game. <laughs> there's a game state that is the playing state. Uh, there's also this pause menu, which uh, I wanted to demonstrate kind of having a stack of game states where we have this. This is a different game state, and I'll show it to you. It's the pause menu over here. 
Um, the one that apparently has changes I haven't committed. I should look into that. Um, but it is rendering the pause state, but also the previous game state, which is the playing state behind it. And I wanted to demonstrate how you do that. When you go into the settings menu, it goes back to this. And I'll up the zoom level again. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to turn it back down because I want to show you that it works when we save that. So anyway, um, I'll just quit. Fine. Uh, and yeah, when we start it up again, once it's done shutting down, and again, I'm never going to be able to pull this over in time. Oops, yep, see, I missed because it made itself smaller. Okay, here it is on a 1x. It starts up in 3x zoom um, because, uh, show you down here, this is where you set up the initial dimensions for your window, and then once it gets into startup, it uh, loads up the setting, gets the zoom level, and sets the zoom there. And this, I mean, arguably there shouldn't be a one-liner like this, but it works. Um, so anyway, there is a brief moment where you see the three times zoom all floating. Whatever. Okay, uh, what else to talk about in this crazy project? Uh, the pause menu. Um, Again, showing off how you get a previous state. It shows off um, sending in config objects into these um, different game states. So if we find usages, here we go. You can change state into a pause menu and give it a config. And maybe for readability, I should really spell this out. It's a new pause menu config object that this thing wants. Um, and that's just a record. It contains the previous state. And this is how the pause game says, OK, who's my previous state? I'm going to make sure to draw that. And also, when you leave the um, Here's the menu for resume. When you leave the uh, pause menu, you take you back to the previous state. So showing you how to set up all that kind of stuff. Using the keyboard, Play Play Mini gives you a different keyboard service that lets you do some handier things, like have you pressed any of several acceptable keys. Um, I also use that in the playing for when you're moving the paddle left and right. I wanted to support WAS, but also left and right, and also the numeric keypad, which people seem to forget. I love the numeric keypad, so I wanted to support it here. Uh, and I think that's it. I don't know. Um, there's a whole progression thing. You, you can, the high score table honestly is probably uh, a little too high to, uh, for most people to get. I think you have to at least beat one level. And the game gets pretty fast. Uh, it's pretty mean. If you wanted to cheat yourself onto the high score table, uh, you could come into the game over a game state and just like hack yourself an extra 50,000 or something. Uh, and then you'll get to enter your name on the high score table, no problem. So <laughs> anyway, um, and yeah, this game over game state also draws the game behind. I might as well show that. Um, and if you have a high enough score, it lets you enter your, your score. So let's do all that. And it's going to be off screen for a sec. I'm going to set it back to three times zoom and then pull it on. OK. So I don't know. I'll just die. Oh, also, there are noises. Sorry, you probably can't hear them. Um, but the sound effects are in here and they work and it plays, um, the bounces are different. It's one, just one file, just a single wave file and the bounces are um, different pitches depending on uh, what you, what block you get. Also we can see the, ooh, that time it worked. Sometimes it goes right through the edge of the paddle. More often than not I would say. So that's one of the bugs. So anyway, you can type in my initials, wee colors, and uh, where am I? Oh, there I am down there, eighth place. Oh, sorry, you can't see my mouse. Something this game project doesn't show off is the mouse, but whatever. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's the project. If you would like to make any pull requests on this thing, um, sorry, let's uh, find, where where did it go? Where's my, here we go. If you'd like to make any pull requests uh, to improve maybe the physics code, that's fine. Um, I probably really won't work on this. This, is a, this project, this block break project, is, for me is super low priority. It's out, it's done, it's here for people to look at and use and hopefully easily make a game with Play Play Mini. I will probably update it when I improve or like add some features to Mono Game. So one thing I wanted to improve, sorry, I meant to talk about it at the time. Let's look at the code again briefly. Um, is making it easier to do asynchronous code. So if we look at the startup, I manually spin up a task. And that works, but it's a little bit dangerous. Um, Mono Game itself will complain, for example, if you try to set the zoom level inside a task. I would prefer to do that as part of the task because it takes a little bit of time. Um, but I can't. If you mess with the graphics uh, in some ways Mono Game in a different thread, Mono Game will freak out and crash. So there are ways around that. You can make sure that certain things run on the, the, like the UI thread and blah, blah, blah. I haven't quite wrapped my head around a, how to do that and be the best way to do that. Um, that's something I would like to build into Play Play Mini to make asynchronous tasks easier. 
Um, if you've used Unity, which I would still argue, I'm talking about Play Play Mini a lot. If you're making a really big game, and especially 3D, you should probably just use Unity. But Unity has coroutines, uh, is what they call them. I would like to do something that's a little closer to native, uh, or I shouldn't say native, but just, I don't know, like what we're used to in the .NET world. Um, Unity has this fun problem, and there's good reasons, but they're running on like funny old custom version of C Sharp. And so there's just some things that are a little wacky in Unity that are, I don't know, for me, part of the resistance and friction in using Unity is I don't have all the C Sharp features I really want to use. Um, like dependency injection, oh my goodness, and that's not even a C Sharp feature. They could have that if they wanted. Um, but, but anyway, so yes, that is a thing. That is an example of a thing that when I get that working, I will put it into um, this block break project and then would use it in other places. Like if we check the uh, settings menu, when it saves the settings, that only takes like a tenth of a second. It's okay that it lags the game. Like you would notice the stars in the background pause for like the briefest of moment. If you could, actually, the game resolution changing makes that hard. But there's other database operations that, that you might see that would lag the game. And in most cases, it's small enough you, you don't care. But it would be ideal, right? And especially if it was very easy to wrap them up in a little async task and not lag the game. So that's something I'm, I'm working on for, for Play Play Mini. Um, and again, that's the sort of thing I would update block break for. But other than that, the messy physics code, I'm leaving that in place. Uh, if someone wants to make a pull request to clean that up, pull it out into a service, or something, that'd be great. Um, one thing you might look at for comparison is the star field. So generally, just over time, I have happened to like, in addition to sealed classes, uh, having dumb objects where, and like the ball is an example of this. There's no logic on the ball. Uh, there is something else that, that handles that. Um, depending on your architecture, that's considered a, a pattern or an anti-pattern. Um, and I'm not going to tell you which one is right or wrong. It depends on how you want to do the rest of your project. So um, again, showing different ways to do the same thing. The ball, uh, the paddle, these are all um, dumb data objects that services would manage or just the game state. Uh, ideally, you would have a physics service or something that acts on the ball and moves it around according to physics. Um, the star field, though, is an example of a thing that does have its logic along with its data, right? It's keeping its own state and managing it and updating things according to its logic contained right here. So, so that would be a way maybe to pull out the, um, the ball, maybe. I don't know. So anyway, again, as with programming everywhere, there's a billion ways to do everything. Um, this project tries to show a few different ways to do different types of things. Pick the thing that makes the most sense for, for your project. Um, you know, maybe serializing data with a binary serializer is great. Um, I got away with that with Mysterious Space because it was a roguelike. Um, so even though I was going to publish updates that would probably break your save game, which can happen very easily when you're doing the binary serializers, um, I figured that was okay because any game wasn't going to last more than two hours. Who cares if your save game is broken? Um, so, you know, that's a, a cost I was willing to accept. Uh, but I think databases now at this point, I just say, ah, it's so easy, just do it all the time, um, which is part of the reason I wanted to demonstrate with this project. But again, it's up to you, maybe for your use cases, maybe you're super familiar with the binary serializer and, and maybe you're not worried about breaking save games and stuff. And you could blend the approaches, maybe for settings you'd rather not do it in the database because of things like this, you know, initial startup time during the startup menu. Like, oh, I don't want to wait for any framework to start up and give that little delay, you know, so maybe, uh, you, you know, mix and match solutions. It's, you know, depends on your needs and your priorities. So anyway, I've rambled plenty, more than plenty, I would say. So thank you very much for watching. I hope this is interesting and useful. I will put a link to all these things in the description. Thank you very much and goodbye.